let me introduce our next speakers. Um, our next speakers are going to talk about cancer survivorship care delivery and clinical research. And these presentations are going to be made by Dr. Sheetal Kircher and Sophia Garcia. So Sheetal Kircher is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She's a GI oncologist and medical co-director of Lurie Cancer Center's Cancer Survivorship Institute. So Dr. Kircher's research in interests include improving the quality of cancer care and understanding the trends in use and expenditures of services and drugs. She's also interested in evaluating cancer-related health policies. Uh, Dr. Sofia Garcia is an associate professor in the Departments of Medical Social Sciences and Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Northwestern University Feidenberg School of Medicine, and she's a, li a licensed clinical psychologist. She's director of the clinical, re of clinical research for the Cancer Survivorship Institute of Lurie Cancer Center, and she has 14 years of experience in patient reported outcome measured development and applications in oncology. Her, re her research is focused on developing and implementing patient-reported outcomes measures and evaluating patient-centered care initiatives, including those that incorporate health information technology and are tailored to vulnerable populations. So let's welcome Dr. Kircher and Dr. Garcia. Thank you for the intro. Um, can you hear me? And I just want to do a quick show of hands of how many people in here are either um, clinically seeing survivorship patients, trying to run a survivorship program, giving out a care plan at the patient level. Okay, great, awesome. Um, so uh, I wanted to make this talk a little uh, practical and kind of let you know where we're at with our survivorship program, the barriers we've run into, and kind of hopefully leave some time for some discussion, but I'll be around all day, because I'd love to talk to programs on what you're actually doing and how we're gonna do this type of um, stuff. But I, as everything, I um, typically, all that interest that I have in research and clinically always starts with the patients. And um, so I wanna tell you about a patient. Um, oh. So at age 38, she noticed some um, blood in her stools. She knew this wasn't normal. She saw um, her primary care doctor a few times, actually. Um, and you know the normal things of hemorrhoids and fissures and things like that are way more common than cancers. You know, luckily she she's a advocate for herself, and she at the third visit said, "I'm getting a colonoscopy," and kind of said, "That's what's going to happen at this point." and she was found to have a stage three rectal cancer. Um, treatment for rectal cancer is tough. It's, um, especially when you're 38 years old, she was kind of in the dating scene still. She has an, um, she didn't have any children, very supportive family. I don't know why this keeps going on automatic. Um, but chemotherapy, so the treatment for rectal cancer is chemo radiation followed by surgery and then more chemotherapy. Ostomies are the rule, at least temporarily, and some people have ostomies permanent. And when you're 38 years old in the dating scene, um, you know, she's kind of going up in her career. This was just rocked her world. Um, but she, she, she did a fantastic, she thrived. She, um, she learned what it meant to be an advocate, and she was kind of an advocate for herself even before. Um, the, what struck me the most was when she showed up to our local pool, we live in the same town, um, in a bikini while she still had an ostomy. And I think I just like stopped, hugged, and, and was like in tears. But, um, but it's rough, so she's, so she's done with treatment. Um, and, you know, I was used to seeing her about every week for a while, every two weeks. And then, and then I gave her the great news of her CT scan uh, result. And I was like, great, see in three months, you get a break from me. And that's when things really started to change for her. I mean, at first she's like, yay, oh crap. Like, oh, where's my kercher? And, and, you know, she was dealing with incontinence still and uh, sexual dysfunction, like, times 10 and still in the dating scene and has a boyfriend and and how do we deal with this and my job and my career and my life and and I just said I'll see you in three months with the new CT scan um, so so our kind of history of cancer survivorship starts a long long time ago 2006 when was when first and even before that when Dave Sala was was 
pioneering things, but the Institute of Medicine um, said in 2006, like, we have a crisis. We have a growing, you know, complexity of our patients. I'm sorry, this is like an autopilot somehow. Um, and not much happened. It was kind of like crickets after that. 2013, the IOM again said, we are in a crisis, people. We need high quality cancer care. We need to you know, understand our workforce, rising costs and everything like that. And survivorship start, you know, again, kind of pinged to the top. This really got some teeth in it in 2015 when the Commission on Cancer, um, as we all know, had some pretty, um, you know, ambitious, uh, aggressive, whatever word you want to use, uh, ways of, does anyone have a solution for this? No, the, the whole thing about it just automating? Um, so I had a pretty aggressive solution of using survivorship care plans as the vehicle for um, delivering survivorship care. And from 2015 to 2019, we were, going, we were to ramp up our services and deliver 100% of eligible patients uh, survivorship care plans uh, by the year 2019. Pardon me, you can use the arrow. Thank you. So. Um, that's when people started really going, you know, a little bit more excited. And once you put teeth into it, people are like, okay, wait, let's study these survivorship care plans. Um, and randomized studies were, were really, uh, really generally negative for these proximal out, for more distal outcomes of survivorship. Um, there were some positive uh, studies that looked at more, more kind of uh, proximal outcomes of information received, satisfaction, and those did seem to be helpful. Um, but survivorship care plans, like in the research setting, never kind of emerged as like the answer to our problems. And I think those of us that treat patients kind of like, no, it's got to be the vehicle, but not the answer. I mean, me printing something out and checking the box, that's really just not what um, the patients need. They need a more comprehensive look at what, um, what they're struggling with. And so um, the Commission on Cancer and APBC really were, I, I feel, very attuned to what was going on in practices and the difficulties and challenges that we were having. And so their, their guidelines and mandates have really changed dramatically over the last five years and have softened um, to, to what was recently released in the last couple of weeks where there's 2020 standards where um, they are now requiring that the requirement for survivorship care plans is gone as far as percentages and we are now required to have a team, a survivorship team, formally uh, kind of designate three survivorship services that um, will be helpful and then document how many people are receiving those services. Um, I think it's a great, I, I, I kind of approached this standard with two feelings. One, I'm like, oh, don't take away the stick. Like, I need the stick to get people to care about survivorship because I think when that mandate came, people started caring. And then I realized it was really hard to give survivorship care plans to thousands of people. Um, and I do feel like this new standard gives us the opportunity to think about what patients need. What do they need? In, as opposed to checking off thousands of care plans. So there's this dynamic, um, so we will see kind of how this new version plays out. Um, so like I said, you know, we have a lot of people here at Northwestern. So that daunting task, you know, that I had of like, how do I get everyone here a care plan? We have thousands of patients. So I once again brought it back to my patient. And this new standard really gives us the opportunity, I think, for me to think of these things more. It brings me back to her where I'm like, well, what is she telling me is the problem? And, and I'm hearing, oh man, I'm hearing all of this. Um, and these are, the, these are the things we don't do as well. When I said I'll see you in three months, I'm not sure I addressed these quite as well as, I, um, as we all could. Um, so it's so interesting that I'm the third person today to say that one size does not fit all, which we did not plan. Um, but I think that I'm excited for the survivorship program to not have to focus on kind of feeding a mass this care plan. And I get to really start thinking about, you know, which different survivorship needs come with age. 
you know, we know that cognition and mobility is a major issue in our geriatric and frail population, and maybe they need a different tailored assessment to then refer. So I, I'd like to um, think of this as an algorithm. I think my brain thinks of an algorithms, and depending on which of these types of groups you fall into, um, I imagine as we move towards more patient-reported outcomes and kind of really assessing patients, we should do this in, an, in a very tailored way and a very actionable way. I mean, um, I want to know that I'm going to assess with the right tool, um, so screen in an efficient way, and then have an action to do and refer to uh, educate, to address, to do something other than just knowing that my patient is struggling. Um, so the way we've worked it out here, and it's obviously evolving still, is we have two essential models of our survivorship care. I call it the comprehensive model, and that name changes all the time, and an embedded model. Um, so in what I call high volume, high risk patients, so we've designated that as breast, lymphoma, transplant, leukemia, and testicular cancer. Um, we have a dedicated nurse practitioner who spends this like glorious 60 minutes with the patient, sometimes more, um, in a referral program, and then follows the patient annually. That's like the Cadillac model. Uh, the resources it takes is a full-time APP and a nurse coordinator as well. Um, which we don't currently have right now. I know I can see some people that have programs like, oh my God, wouldn't that be nice, right? Um, and then most of our other programs are in what's called, an, I'm calling an embedded model, and that's like the docs and the APPs and the nurses taking care of their patient is giving them their care plan. It's pretty bare bones. We try to make our care plans um, as educational as possible and educate people, but really that's kind of like in my mind still a lot of the checkbox of just giving them a care plan and hope that that vehicle is good enough. Um, hopefully we can make those services as robust as possible, but they're really done in the confines of the clinic that they're currently, the 15 minute appointment is still 15 minutes for those folks. Um, and you know, we, we hope, so the topics covered on the right are in all of our care plans and in the comprehensive model there's really a more of an opportunity to dig into those and that's where I see some very tailored assessments happening based on some disease and patient characteristics. Um, here just a little more into the comprehensive model because this is really where my kind of baby and focus is these days. I don't think our health system is set up to be able to deal with the number of survivors that we see. Um, especially areas like breast and lymphoma. Um, ooh, right now, I mean, I would say that a lot of oncologists are seeing their patients 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years out, and that's just not sustainable probably as a system, as a country. And so um, a transition of care model is really what we are aiming and going towards, and this is through a lot of years of experimentation, we feel like the best of really replacing one of the MD visits a year with the survivorship APP with the transition of care model in some patients. So many patients can be transitioned back to their primary care doctor. That nurse practitioner is really responsible for that communication and getting that patient well set up with their PCP in a higher risk population or patient preference, provider preference, they would continue to follow with the survivorship provider once a year um, in folks that, that maybe have higher needs. Um, so the biggest challenge with this is actually just um, everyone agrees on it. The providers are like, yes, please, I need to clear up my schedule, please. Um, is just logistics, getting it scheduled properly, getting it like to function in an operational way is actually the biggest Concerned. I love that I'm seeing people's head nods. You have no idea, like, how much I want to hug you. Um, so, so, and then this is kind of the classic embedded model of it's like a one and done, here's your care plan, and then they follow on as we, you know, normally do after five years, which is kind of a, a, with a lot of variation. Um, so, these are the challenges that, I can, I can look here. These are really the challenges and some of them I've gone through. One of the biggest challenges that I think every year gets better, like it's so slow, but it is getting better over the last, you know, maybe five years that I've been working on this, is buy-in. Um, the institution here at Northwestern is, is 
overwhelmingly supportive, as you can see with the Survivorship Institute, and um, you know, translating that into buy-in from a staffing standpoint and resources is always more challenging because making a program such as this fiscally um, sustainable is challenging. And I think a lot of supportive oncology has that same, um, same feeling. You know, our comprehensive model is a billable visit. It's like an APP high level return visit, essentially. Um, and then the embedded model doesn't bring in any more dollars. Um, I think there needs to be, this is like my soapbox, but there needs to be, this needs to be taken to the higher level of payment models and how we reimburse for cancer care and, and what is included in that kind of management fee of what it takes to take care of a patient. Um, but that could go on forever if I kept talking. You know, the challenges is in the model of care. I mean, we've been through every model here. We've tried a lot of different things and each provider preference and resources, you know, they're like, that's cute, but I don't have time. Um, and that's a major challenge that we continue to face. Operational support, like I said, like getting things scheduled right, um, we're starting to try to use um, some epic tools. Hopefully, uh, Healthy Planet, I feel like is gonna solve all my problems, but I've been wrong before about Epic. Um, and, and just coordination across our region as Northwestern gets larger and larger. You know, I really want survivorship to kind of um, span across all of our regions. And, and I think we have a really great group of people working on survivorship together at each one of our sites. Um, we can care less about the denominator, I guess. You know, I've been kind of spending the last five years trying to get who's eligible for a survivorship care plan, but um, we can kind of focus down on the, the services a little bit more. Um, and just kind of ongoing education and updates is really challenging, so I love forums like this. Um, but really, as most of us kind of need an embedded model teaching people like what does survivorship care look like is really challenging because we have you know 40 oncologists like 40 APPs a lot of nurses and and how do we systemize that I think Sophia will talk a little bit about how patient reported outcomes I think can really help with that um, so this will continue to be a quality metric almost every organization body continues to feel survivorship support and this isn't and that's so exciting to see um, that I don't think that this is going away as far as a portion of care that's important. Um, here's just highlighting a lot of the different um, programs that we have here that I'm not gonna go into. This is just moving right along. This is the leadership once again that here, but really the leaders in this are um, not only these folks that, but, but these folks really outside, you know, in all of our regions kind of delivering care. There's even more, more than I'm displaying here, especially over in the West region where they have an embedded model and a lot of APP, or nurses and APPs working on this. Um, just wanted to, um, if we, we, the person that's missing on here is unfortunately one of our, um, uh, one of our leads over at, at Nora Lake Forest, I felt like I needed to give a shout out, Maggie, who passed away this year, but really contributed to a ton to survivorship at Northwestern and greatly missed, so I thought I'd give a shout out. 